Hello and welcome to Deep Impact, a proud member of the Doof Network where we dive deep into Wabo's most second work, five years on. Coming up next is Elliot Diebold. And that was Ruben Morehouse. And we are back to talk about Collateral 4.9, which uh, yeah. which picks up almost immediately after Collateral 4.8 ends. Um, Blake just kind of heads home after his successful delivery of, <laughs> of, a, of an imp to Conquest. Um, he comes home to a cold house, but uh, Joel has left a note with some food in the fridge and that his cousin has stopped by twice. Yeah, and I mean, I, th- I think at this point you're just sort of thinking, oh, God, I hope it's Paige, like, as if he needs... Yeah any more bullshit uh from other people now <laughs> this a while ago i i realized i i just remembered this when i was first reading pact for a moment i thought wait is that rose did is this rose <laughs> um but we find out no it's not rose uh, uh imagine so, that like yeah. if, if rose had woke it up and she was corporeal and so like she's just like oh i guess i'll go to blake's house yeah yeah yeah, I mean, like, where else would you go? That, yeah, but I think she would have. She would go. She would have stayed um, anyway, there. Anyway, yeah, I love how um, this chapter kind of gets right back into the action, keeping you tense because Blake's family is just shorthand for bad, right? Like, <laughs> any time when his family has got in contact with him, you know that that's a bad thing, and you're put on edge immediately, which is fun. Yeah, well, we sort of go from the house is empty to well, actually, that's probably a good thing. To uh, Blake's family, like there's a bit of a yo-yo in these opening paragraphs as like Blake yeah. sort of tumbles through all the emotions that he's trying to deal with while still being super gross. He- he's covered in stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so uh, his first move when he gets home, I think rightfully so, is to clean himself <laughs> extensively. Um, as if any did- amount of showering could possibly yeah. be enough. Like... Yeah. I feel like I'd be in there literally for hours. In fact, we don't get an idea of how long he was in there, but if it was like four hours, I wouldn't hold it against him. Yeah, I I, I felt like I needed to shower after <laughs> after reading last week's, uh, the last chapter. Um, anyway, so he, 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 he basically leaves his clothes in the hallway. He, he like strips down in the hallway to leave his clothes there, presumably to be burned later. Um goes to have a, a long shower and pours hydrogen peroxide into his wounds, which sounds painful but necessary. Yeah, yeah, definitely worth it. Um, I'm gonna read out. I'm gonna read out this quote, which is, uh, well, it is what it is. <laughs> the water that ran off me was pink brown, and it wasn't the lines I'd drawn on myself that made it brown. When I bent down, I saw that the brown was composed of specks, bugs, thousands, so small I could barely make them out with a naked eye. Oh. Which is gross, I, you know. I mean, reading that made me want to have a shower now. <laughs> I I literally stopped for a few seconds and shuddered when I read that. Yeah. Um, yeah. For the first time ever, I'm starting to think think bugs could be scary. You know, who who you would have didn't thought? Get that from worm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um. So yeah, he he basically, you know extensively cleans himself uh starts tending to his wounds actually yeah <laughs> so <laughs> then he makes an interesting choice which is that he starts covering up his wounds with glamour oh, um, God, Blake. yeah so <laughs> he starts off like you know masking his fresh wounds so that he doesn't stand out so much which is an okay idea and then he takes some glamour and he basically photoshops away some of his scars from when he first ran away um yeah Okay, uh, so mm. I'm going to come back to the god awful idea that is what Blake just did. Um, but I also wanted to mention, uh, as he's hopping out of the shower, he has a look at his tattoos quickly, and uh, I, I'm still trying to understand exactly what all the various bits of his tattoos represent about his mm. status. But it, it seems like what happened after he saw Pauz the first time is less mm. of an issue. So that's good, hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah, anyway, so where's Rose when you need her? Because, like, <laughs> this is where we need Rose to just call Blake out on his bullshit. This glamour idea, it, like, this is something he should have been really minimal with. Like, it's uh, it's really yeah. only the biggest, most visible stuff. Because, like, I can see the addictive power of it. Like, because he oh, seems yeah, to stop being in pain. But there's no way that this is a long... Well, this is not a long-term plan. I mean, it... it- I would have said that, but this is the first step to it becoming a long-term plan, right? Like, I don't know. The, it, now that he's made that decision once, it's going to be a lot easier to use Glamour to just kind of, you know, 
cosmetically alter his appearance going oh, forward. No, sure, but using glamour a lot is not a good long-term plan. Oh, I plan. see. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, you're right. <laughs> of course, it's a terrible plan. Um, he's becoming dependent on glamour if he goes down that route. And yeah, so this is the first time he's not just used glamour cosmetically, but used any real kind of magic for any- anything that isn't kind of like self-defense or any anything that hasn't really been forced on him, right? Um yeah, I love that you pointed this out. It hadn't really occurred to me, but wait, that you're right. That's a big deal. This is the first time that I can think of where he's used significant magic in an elective capacity, not like yeah. out of necessity. Yeah, and and that's important because um, a, a lot of the things we've learned about devils are, hey, we can <laughs> we can improve parts of your life. We can do things for you, be beneficial to you, but you know, you t- you pay a cost. Um, and, yeah. and that's basically what Blake is doing here on a smaller scale. He's making a small cosmetic change to himself for, what, an increased risk that if something goes wrong, he'll get some backlash, right? That's basically the trade-off. Um, yeah, well, it, I mean, it just feels like he's starting to like slip down a bit of a slope, really. Like, uh, yeah. You know, oh, he, yeah, totally. He's gone from uh, barely using the glamour. Well, actually, there wasn't really a period of that. He dove pretty headfirst in with the glamour. Uh, yeah. And now, now he's becoming more and more dependent on it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, yeah. I think this is a first step down a path that leads to a hefty dose of diabolism for him. So, <laughs> oh, it's good to see. He only read the introduction to Black Lamb's Blood, and already he's on the path, Elliot. Yeah, and we still <laughs> haven't found out anything about what was in that. Like he seemed to think it wasn't useful, but. I don't, mm. I don't know what he read, and it was given to mm. him by the lawyers, so I don't trust it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this is so messed up. I mean, he's... Later on, Blake Blake kind of notes that he's done this uh, later in the chapter, and he kind of points out, oh, history is important to me, right? Otherwise, why would I have done this? And so it's so yeah. interesting, like, this... Because this isn't just... Um, this isn't just altering his appearance. Like, Blake has talked about how the events that have given him those scars have made him into the man that he is right you know obviously those are negative events but they've shaped his uh his compassion they've shaped his personality and he's kind of obviously erasing a scar doesn't mean he's forgetting that but it is kind of a step towards putting it out of his mind right see okay you say using glamour to rub out the scar doesn't mean he's going to forget that part of his life but this is packed. I don't. I don't know. Sure, like- <laughs> you're right. You're right. Uh, I, I, thinking about it in terms of like using makeup to cover it up is, is what I'm saying. But yeah. you're right that in packed, even it, using a glamour to do that might. I mean, Blake doesn't fucking know. It might have some effect where it just like actually transforms the person he is to, well, to take away the parts that were inspired by what gave him those scars. Yeah, I mean, the last time he was overusing glamour, he literally started to think like uh, a young child. Yeah, so, you're right. It, 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 it's magic. It has effects beyond the physical, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. It, so, anyway. You know, I, I, I get your idea. point, though. <laughs> this would be significant even if it was just makeup sort of thing that he was that he was oh, doing. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. So, uh, uh, we did have that. We, ha- we had uh, Sandra Duchamp's interlude, and, and her aunt was using glamour to make herself look younger, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and you you get the vibe that this is something that Duchamp's do is kind of just like cosmetically adjust their appearance, and it's yeah he he's he's kind of taking a step to being that kind of practitioner more now, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um uh, he's really starting to enter this world. You know, he's now officially been labeled a diabolist, a, a label he admits yeah. is accurate later in this chapter, and I guess I mean, we're starting to see demon. that perme- <laughs> Yeah, we're starting to see that permeate a bit a bit more into yeah. the other parts of his life. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I think we could talk about what this uh, one, <laughs> you know, two lines means for a long time, but we should probably keep going. Um, well, uh, I just, guess yeah. the one last thing I want to mention, uh, the glamour is not just hair anymore. It's starting to imitate the look of the chain, but it's all, mm. like, barbed and... Uh, I Yeah, I don't know. Wait, this is a bit of a thing, surely. Um, yeah. I, it, Blake it could... wonders if it's something to do with Pose and his radiation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which makes sense. I mean, it's like a it's like a warped version of it's like a mean version of the chain. <laughs> yeah, but does that? I mean, what if it's had an effect on the glamour? You know, like what if we're mm. what if this round of glamour is going to have some other insidious effect? Something about the glamour's mm. been inverted that he's not aware of, and and it's going to go badly. You know. Yeah. True. True. 
Um, yeah. Anyway, so we should move on from the glamour chat for a, for a moment. Uh, so so after after photoshopping himself, uh, Blake <laughs> takes the phone number that was left for him by Joel and calls his cousin. Uh, and a female voice answers, which to him narrows it down to either Ellie or Paige. He also um, briefly considers Molly, which is tragic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he is his mind kind of instinctively thinks, "Oh, Molly. Oh, oh, no, wait. No, yeah, not Molly." So his brain still hasn't kind of caught up there in some regards. Um, yeah. So this is a fun little phone conversation because you don't know who he's talking to uh, until you kind of figure it out. As Blake figures it out, um, and then it's not really even explicitly pointed out that it's Paige until you know everyone's picked it out, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the fact that she's not immediately a massive arsehole to him kind of narrows it right down to Paige from the yeah. get-go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I just like the dynamic of, like, you, you're kind of put in the mindset of, you know, recalling characteristics about the family that you know, and so it's not just like, oh, it's whoever, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter too much. You're kind of already thinking about, oh, it's this. if it's this person, they'd be acting like this. And so you're kind of recalling... It prompts you to recall characterization details by yourself in an interesting little way that I, I just kind of like it as a little device. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so Paige has dropped by twice because the police have been calling her and, and talking to her, trying to get more information on Blake. Uh, she is kind of really weirded out by the whole death of Molly situation and by him now suddenly inheriting the house. Um, and it becomes kind of clear that the police are turning elements in his life against him and, page is one that has basically almost succeeded yeah and this is bad because we've already had mentioned you know blake has his two victories and so now the third one is important regardless of who wins him or laird uh mm. you know as we saw with tromos in the in the famulus book so i like this is concerning this is very bad yeah. uh if if laird is up to stuff because blake doesn't have the bandwidth to do anything about it right now yeah yeah, there's one part in here specifically that I find interesting, which is um, through this conversation it becomes apparent that Paige doesn't think of them as having been friends, whereas Blake definitely does. Blake thinks, you know, oh, we were actually quite close, you, me, and Molly. And, and Paige is like, no, we weren't. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, which is an interesting note. And it, it's kind of like, is Paige spooked by the police? Is Blake misremembering what, what's going on here? Uh, I, I'm curious on your take. Yeah, I I feel like there's so many things this could be. Like I have I've absolutely no idea. Like it, this could be the Duchamps like fucking with connections when the police came to talk with her. Like a Duchamp could have been around, and uh, you know we think they've already pointed his family at him once. Uh, she definitely Paige gave off a very different vibe than she did in one point mm. one. Um, yeah, she, she did seem very friendly. Like like uh, Blake's interpretation of her being a close friend made sense to me at least, from his perspective in the conversation they mm. had. Um, yeah. I, I wonder if, it, like, you know, it could just be also, like, yeah, and it's not necessarily just one of these things. It could be a, a mixture of all of them. Like, she's, she's obviously bitter about him specifically getting the house over everyone else because she knew that a lot of the females might be in front of her, but then to learn that Blake's in front of her as well, it must have been a bit of a gut punch. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I yeah. I like this bit where she... She says, like, you know, oh, I hope you'll understand if I think you're lying about a lot of this. Because, mm. mm. like, it catches Blake off guard, but it has nothing to do with practitionery things. Like, you know, we, we see the word, like, lying now, and I'm instantly like, oh, Blake can't do that. Um, but Paige <laughs> doesn't know that. And, and Blake doesn't even think, like, well, I can't do that. I'm a practitioner uh, to himself. He's just he's just sort of like, well, no, why, why would you think I'd lie to you? Like, why would you think that? Yeah. And that's what kicks off that whole we were mates thing. That And she's like, no, we weren't. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. kind of, it's sad. Like, you know, Blake doesn't have many nice family connections. And it seems like this one has been soured by something. Yeah. And, um, and, and I mean, there's that doubt. Like, it could be that he's blown it up in his head. Like, you know, it sounds like his relationship with Paige and Molly growing up was one of the only positive things about his whole interaction with his family. So yeah. maybe he did yeah, totally. exaggerate it. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so Paige is kind of, Blake accidentally let slip that it was a murder and, and Paige, <laughs> you know, I mean, Paige pretty obviously thinks she's in that scene where the killer accidentally says something that, that they're not yeah. meant to know. Well, um, good old loves and, to argue semantics. Paige picks up on, yeah. on that word choice. 
Yeah, uh, so Blake kind of has to let some information slip so that she doesn't think that he's literally a murderer. And so he kind of tries to convince her... I mean, he tells the truth, sort of. He tells her <laughs> that there's some kind of, like, secret society, cultish inheritance, weird shit happening with, with Granny Rose and in Jacob's Bell. Um, yeah, it's like the yeah. redacted truth, basically. Yeah, it's like the most... It's the mundane, the human muggle version of the truth. Yeah. Uh, I really like this line. As as Blake sort of decides that he needs to start telling her, you know, this uh, obfuscated version of the truth... Uh, one of the opening lines to a paragraph is, uh, she was a problem, <laughs> which is very hostile thinking uh, from Blake, particularly with someone he's just been trying to make a case to that they were actually really good friends growing up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then he and then he specifically thinks he's got to treat her like conquest and pose. So that's yeah, that's where he's yeah. his head is right now. Like, which is like this is not good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but it does kind of work, this plan. Um, Paige kind of seems to buy that something weird is going on, and, you know, it, it, she seems to kind of come back on side by the end of the conversation, uh, basically asking Blake, hey, can I can I do anything to help? Um, and, yeah, so it, it, it works. Blake uh, is, is kind of getting better at this, right? Um, he's, he seems to be actually able to hold up his end of the kind of legalese negotiation conversation stuff. Um, yeah. Rose is not around, and Blake is kind of you know filling filling the gap a bit. Yeah, I don't I don't even I I don't know about that because what really works here is he he tells the truth. You know, uh, obviously if we as we said it's redacted, but he lets her in with enough to give her some understanding of the gravity of the situation. And I think that's mm. I'd actually say that's quite a Blake approach. Like he's just he's kind of open and honest, and uh, like uh, not that Rose isn't like. <laughs> I don't want to be unfair to Rose, but like that, mm. it does just seem like Blake to just sort of be like, well, actually, here's the situation as much as he can, which is essentially what he ends up doing. Yeah, I, 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 I think you're right, but you know, he definitely has the thought of, okay, what does she want to get out of this conversation? How do I, you know, how do I appease her? Like, yeah, that's true. The fact yeah. that we see into his brain, I think, means you know, there, there's a, he, he shows us there's a little bit more going on behind the scenes there. I think. Yeah, I also I I will have to call out this bit where he is you know sort of arguing with Paige and he starts a sentence by going Rose, uh, Paige like he he almost calls her <laughs> Rose. Um, <laughs> it's, it's so good. I mean, it's hilarious. It, it's sad because it reminds me that Rose is missing. Uh, yeah, it's a funny comparison between the two and how Blake sees the two. Like he he I think he just sort of entered autopilot. Uh, arguing with someone he doesn't want to be arguing with mode. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's like, yeah, this is the default when he has a conversation he doesn't want to have to have. Is he starts yeah. it with... Uh, oh, no, wait. Well, yeah, it's definitely a bit of an insight into how he views uh, this conversation with Paige and his general conversations with Rose, <laughs> uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this kind of conversation kind of wraps up and, and Paige is a bit back on side, uh, not completely convinced. It's a she bit ambiguous, but... She seems, seems to be, be kind of happy. She yeah. seems to have bought it at least a little. Yeah. Seems to. Um, and and so Blake kind of takes the opportunity to write a note of of what he's learned so far to, you know, his next in line or anybody who kind of finds it, um, who is next in the Thorburn line, basically summing up what he thinks about what's going on and all the kind of gotchas that he can think of to to call them out. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's basically a concrete list of stuff that rose senior or yeah or mostly rose senior should have already left for them rather than that like you know book that was kind of generic um yeah i don't get this sense that yeah. rose senior was a very good educator um <laughs> so i guess yeah that, that's probably a uh, part of it but yeah um i mean it's probably cathartic for blake as well just you know it's like writing a diary entry it's probably good for him to sort of stop and reflect a bit through through something like this yeah. if nothing else yeah well, you know, his uh, his usual chance to reflect is gone at this point, so... <laughs> nice. Um, oh, yeah, reflect as well is a <laughs> pun because of mirrors. Uh, anyway, so I thought yeah, that was on he, purpose. <laughs> he leaves this note, um, which I'm sure won't be important later. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. It's never going to come up again. I, I, I mean, I hope he didn't leave it out on the table. Like, that well, was why... Later, he's, talk he's talking to Fel and he says, oh, I fell asleep. 
at the dining table. Yeah, exactly. So he clearly was writing this note and he's just kind of, I don't know. He might have just left it on his dining table and rushed off to, to meet Fel. I mean, that's that's exactly why I sort of said that. Like, There's there's <laughs> the gap from he's still writing it to suddenly he's outside and we have no idea where the, where the notes ended up. Yeah. Um, so uh, Fel has kind of come to pick up Blake for day two, uh, the next <laughs> trial, and Blake decides to investigate the goblin next. Uh, but first he wants to meet the Knights of the Basement. Um, yeah. Get some info so that he can start thinking about the abstract demon. And then also before he goes to see them, he, he also wants to drive by the hyena's hideout to get a sense. So he's trying to emulate what Rose had him do with Pose, which is you go and you check things out and then you... You scope Take, it out, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so he's he's sort of doing the checkout for both today, and then you know he'll he'll uh, go back to the hyena, I guess, once he's done with the knights. If he can't, yeah. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm kind of hoping he recruits them to help him somehow because uh, he needs it. <laughs> he yeah, he needs some backup. I think uh, he's he's taken a bit of a beating. Um, <laughs> so Blake kind of notices that Fell is driving faster than Blake is really kind of comfortable with. Um, yeah. it's a great little seed that starts through the second half of this chapter and pays off later, but I, I love you're just kind of made a bit uncomfortable by <laughs> fell driving a bit too fast. Yeah, well, there's, there's very consistent little reminders, uh, spread throughout the whole thing that yeah. just don't let you forget it and make you think, man, like, cause there's a few options as to why he could be doing it. And you're just thinking, what, what is fell doing this for? And eventually we find yeah, out. Yeah, I, I... I think it works on two levels, though, right? Like, it's setting it up towards the end, and it's also just kind of making you uneasy. Like, you know, uh, you, you see a lot of TV shows and movies where people are driving just a bit too fast, and it almost always leads to a scene of some kind of car crash, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so you're kind of put on edge, like, maybe even subconsciously just thinking, oh, something bad's going to happen when someone drives too fast. Yeah. Um, so as they drive, Blake kind of tries to quiz Fell about his his uh, backstory, I guess. Um, he's partially curious and partially just kind of bored by the silence, <laughs> or at least that's what he says to Fell. Yeah, I mean, their conversation in this whole car trip is a lot more civil than their one was in the previous chapter. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they snark at each other a fair bit. They're, they're still not friendly, but uh, it's more civil than it, than it was last time. Uh, yeah. And we find out, yeah, so we get some details on Fell. Like, he says he's not going to uh take the bait but he actually kind of does uh, and <laughs> he gets we find annoyed out into talking yeah pretty much uh and so we find out that his whole family has basically been indebted to conquest for um generations like it you know a, a father is forced to indoctrinate their kids and in fact i yep. wouldn't be surprised if they're also obligated to have those kids like because I think yeah. the obvious solution to a situation like that, if you're in, indented, uh, indentured and can't like can't even kill yourself, would be to just not have kids to pass it on. So I wouldn't be yeah, surprised if the they're yeah, if they're forced to have them. Yeah. Also, Phil um, doesn't have much of a social life, so I can't imagine that they're doing it the old fashioned way. Yeah, I don't know how he's going to have kids. Who knows? Um, but yeah, this is pretty sad, right? Um, Phil doesn't kind of. It, it, it's not, Fel doesn't take the time to kind of let you be sad for him in this conversation, um, but it is kind of messed up. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. He, but it's also so conquest. Yeah. Uh, he, he doesn't give that much time about it, but he does talk about some of his other family. In particular, a line I, I only noticed this read through, I didn't pick up on any other times, where he mentioned, he's talking about what his other family is up to, and he says, My brother died at the hands of goblins trying to save a small town. Which mm. I never noticed before, but it it sounds like Maggie's backstory, right? Yeah, that that actually jumped out to me as well. I I was sort of like, oh, is that? I mean, I, I guess it probably is. Until until we hear otherwise, I'm going to kind of assume it is. Otherwise, it's a it's an unnecessary little bit of detail. Like it, it yeah. seems like why would you put that in if if it wasn't meant to be a nice little uh, connection for for the readers? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I I guess we'll see if it if it comes back. Uh, so. So they're all kind of enslaved to conquest, but they have their little rebellions, right? Um, Fell's real rebellion that he's able to take is taking risks, like driving recklessly. Yeah, what well, I love how Blake points this out to him. Fell sort of talks about where the rest of his family is, and they're all doing this crazy stuff, and Blake just can't help but uh, offer a bit of snark, and is just like, oh, well, and you just drive recklessly, uh, <laughs> kind of belittling him. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's... It's, it's kind of sad, really, that, like, Fell sort of... 
unnecessarily puts himself in little risks because that's all he's able to do. Yeah, yeah. And I guess this is his version of ending the family line, right, is, well, I'll just take small risks and if the universe decides that I'm going to die, well, so be it, you know? Yeah, basically he's he's playing the odds. If he takes lots of small risks, eventually, hopefully one will go wrong, is, is basically his thinking. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think, yeah, it's interesting. The chapter doesn't kind of let you be too bummed out about it um, because they turn a corner and we start getting into the hyenas domain and we get distracted. The conversation basically gets cut off by seeing a bunch of ghosts, uh, mm. ghost people, some ghost trees, a, a <laughs> big potential ghost rock um, that are all basically injured or disfigured. Uh, and this is the goblins domain. Cool. Uh <laughs> I mean, this is this is generally pretty ominous, and I feel like this will be a section once once we've seen the hyena more. I feel like there will be more specific clues in here. Like, I at the moment I'm just mm. like, oh, cool, a bunch of ghosts and some trees, and in general, it's all just like this really creepy picture. But I have a feeling there are details in here that are going to matter later down the line that I'm just missing. Yeah. Um, well, keep. Keep all those ghosts in mind, Elliot, because every <laughs> single one of them is going to be relevant, especially the ghost tree. <laughs> which was I wouldn't be surprised thing. if it was especially the ghost tree. <laughs> it's just such a weird thing to have, a ghost of a tree. I mean, that's what you assume it is, right? It's just a weird... Anyway. Yeah, uh, I, so I was I, just picturing I, the, womp, the whomping willow. I, 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 don't, I don't know why, but when you, when you have a ghost of a tree, I'm going to assume it does something, and the only thing I can think of is the whomping willow. It's... It, it womps. Uh, <laughs> so there's a line I want to call out here, which is an interesting kind of setup line, I think. Um, they're talking about the hyena, and Fell says, Conquest wants it. Uh, or Blake kind of is, is like, oh, Conquest wants it. And Fell says, Conquest wants everything, but yes, Conquest wants this in particular. Why? I'd be betraying my master if I answered that. Simply see to your task. And, and it's like, oh, so there's something special being planned here with the hyena. Like, it's not just a oh, it's a beast, go get it. Because you'd imagine there's more of those beasts around than just this one. It, it's Conquest has a plan for it. Yeah, yeah, well, and we even get a sort of, uh, as as we're getting some details on the hyena, it seems like the hyena's actually been here for a really long time, like perhaps even like over 100 years. And mm. so the fact that Conquest is only dealing with it now means either Blake actually is a very unique opportunity for Conquest just within this task, uh, or Conquest is sort of doing something and he's playing all of his cards, basically. Is, mm. is sort of yeah, what Conquest it, may be making a move. Um, yeah, like this yeah, is this uh, is a, a once, once in a hundred years level Conquest plan, basically. Mm. And what has changed? I mean, Blake has shown up. Is that is that it, right? Like, yeah. It, yeah, it's definitely something is going on with Conquest. Um, something yeah. more than just, hey, I want to basically summon some demons to fuck shit up. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, Fell kind of drops off Blake at the uh, nice Knights of the Basement headquarters, which is a, basically a, a rundown convenience store. Um, <laughs> and out comes one of the knights, uh, just a guy with a shotgun, and he points it at Blake. Uh, yeah. And and I and love. Fell I love. Off. Yeah. Fell just. <laughs> Fell just leaves in there. I love that line where he's like, "Would you prefer if I wait here or?" Or uh, leave you and... Or pick you up later. Yeah, yeah Blake's like, oh, I'd prefer if you wait here. <laughs> and Fel just drives off and Blake's like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> he, he just asks which I'd prefer, not which he should do. It's great. Yeah, it's fun. Um, and so the this uh, knight of the basement comes out and says, you have two seconds to stop me from shooting, he said. Stop conquest, I asked. No hesitation. <laughs> um, so Blake's really r- jumping right in. Uh yeah, I, I've been really digging the ends, like the chapter ending kind of lines lately, you know. Um, there, there's a real art to them, like leaving you on this kind of, n- not quite a cliffhanger, but just like a hint at, oh, there's some awesome shit that's about to happen next chapter, so you better keep reading. Uh, yeah, they're yeah. not like they're not like cliffhangers, it's, it's almost like dramatic segues, is, is almost how yeah. I describe it. Like, because, you know, this is entering a new part, like it doesn't feel cheap to end things here, because... Blake is now entering the Knights of the Basement. This is the start of a new thing, and you sort of see that mm. in in all the recent ones. It's sort of like a line that is just designed to get you excited for the next bit, not a line that feels like it's holding something back from you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and 
I think that's always been the case, but just this chapter, this arc in particular, I, I feel like they've just been really on point. I'm really, uh, really happy with them. Now, Elliot, do you have a prediction you want to make here? I, yeah. I, I, I see in the notes that you want to pull out a prediction that you're making. <laughs> well, okay, so first of all, I should address, I think the quickest ever prediction fall apart would have to be my one about Fell from last episode, uh, where I thought <laughs> Fell was somehow controlling Conquest. Uh, Whoops. That has not... Well, well, that's pretty much already been deconfirmed. <laughs> in this um, very same car ride, yep. Yep, so so instead I've decided to lock in uh, another replacement, and this feels really obvious ever since I thought of it, but uh, Rose is asleep, I think, because Blake is drawing energy from her, not the other way around. Mm. And, uh, I mean, I, I just think there's been a lot of little hints at this spread throughout, but anyway, so that's my new, my new theory, is Blake's going to realise that he's been deteriorating Rose, and I worry that when this gets undone, will there be permanent effects on Rose? Like, I think that's the scary thought here. Like, uh, I don't think this is a thought of the sort of thing Wabo would put so much effort and attention into if there wasn't some sort of larger con- consequence. Mm, interesting. Uh, no comment on that one, but uh, we'll see, I guess, if it pays off. Um, that's the end of our discussion about the chapter, but we wanted to... Uh, th- mix it up a bit and do a discussion question on a topic that is kind of a theme throughout this uh, whole arc. Um, we wanted to kind of give, give a question that you guys could think about and respond to in our chapters over the next week, uh, in, in our discussion threads over the next week, and then um, we'd kind of loop back around to some answers at the end of the next one, I guess, Elliot? Yeah, so I guess, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll probably go through uh, the or whatever answers we get in a week, so... Next episode, yeah, you don't have to get them in by next episode. We'll just probably remind you then if you haven't done it. But uh, yeah, you've got you know a whole week, so much time. Yeah, um, so, <laughs> so much time. And so the question that we wanted to ask was, uh, if you became a practitioner, how would you handle your muggle relationship? Um, this is something that's been coming up more and more this chapter with uh, Blake's family, but also Joel and, and his friends. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what other people think they would do in, in this situation where Blake is, yeah. would they keep them in the dark? Would they try and let them in? Uh, would they let them in in certain circumstances, but not in others? Um, yeah. And, and I think the question is especially relevant because this chapter fell and Blake talk about awareness versus knowledge, right? Um, yeah, totally. does being aware make you stronger or like make you more, uh, less at risk or more at risk? Um, Yeah. So I'm I'm curious I'm curious what your answer is, Ruben. Yeah, well, my answer is I think <laughs> my answer feels like a bit of a cop out. I I think I would make the closest people in my life aware, but there is a way to ask. I I don't know. Like I I feel bad kind of taking agency away in in a potentially quite powerful decision, right? And so I'd probably ask a question that's like basically putting the situation to them in a hypothetical and letting them kind of decide. Uh, so I kind of wrote a little hypothetical that sums up the situation, which is, you know, everybody in the world has a one in a hundred chance of getting a disease, which is fatal if it's untreated, right? You can yep. learn medicine and that means you can reduce the mortality rate of this disease. You can treat it and the mortality rate will go down to 20% on anyone that you treat. But if you learn medicine, you kind of expose yourself more. And so you have like a five in a hundred chance of catching the disease instead. So, you know, a one in a hundred chance that you'll die and anyone you know will die, but you can learn about it, making that chance lower, but your chance of infection is higher. Would yeah, you still learn medicine, right? That's a fair sort of analogy. Yeah. And I think I would get some funny looks from my closest friends and family <laughs> if I asked them this question, but you know, it, it is like a way to give them agency over what they would want to do in this situation. Um, I would definitely want to make them practitioners, though, because if I'm a practitioner, I want more practitioner buddies that I can rely on. You're going to drag everyone straight to hell with you. Well, I'm not saying I'd be a diabolist, but, like, I don't know. I I wouldn't be able to keep myself from showing off magic, I think. Uh, But I'm interested in your answer, Elliot. Yeah, see, I, I, I think I'd probably just keep it to myself um i think the big Mm. thing for me is the concept of uh accepting responsibility for anyone you introduce into the world karmically i i just don't Mm. want that um maybe down the track if i was feeling particularly uh good at practicing uh you know if i lived that Mm. long uh I, i might bring some people in but i think overall i just wouldn't be able to cope with the responsibility of uh both teaching someone and being responsible for 
their karma as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. I think when I was answering, I thought more about the risk of awareness, but you're right that taking on car- other people's karmic balance, you have to really trust a person to, to do that, right? Yeah. I, I mean, definitely yeah. the trick is, you know, like, as Blake's saying, you've got to be able to, like, figure out how to keep it a secret and like because you know it, it invades your life you know you gotta yeah. start making up excuses like i i can't go out tonight i have to go record a podcast <laughs> uh. yeah well that, that's a pretty good excuse people in my life will buy that one i think <laughs> spend too much of my dang time recording podcasts <laughs> um ah, and and speaking of podcasts that's the end of this one i think for today <laughs> That was a planned segue. Um, so if, if you uh, want to get your ruminations on this discussion question in, then you should do so in our discussion threads, which we do for every episode. And you can find the link to uh, the one for this episode in the show notes down below. Yes. And uh, you can find a history of the show and all the other great shows on the Doof Network <laughs> by heading to doofmedia.com. A history of the show makes it sound like, you know, there's, like, documentation about, about, like, when it was founded. and Well, I guess there's an about us there, so you're right, you're right. Um, and you can find more historical documents about the show <laughs> on our Twitter, which is MediaMT Podcast. Uh, yes, and, uh, you know, while we're, while we're talking about the history of the podcast, we should also look towards the future. Uh, and the future mm. of our podcast is very dependent on our Patreons. So <laughs> head to patreon.com slash doofmedia. Uh, to help support us and the rest of the network. Yeah, um, supporting the network gives you a bunch of cool bonuses. Uh, you get access to a special members-only Discord where we talk more about cool stuff, uh, shows as well as miscellaneous TV and movies and, and snakes and all kinds of things. Um, <laughs> as well as if you back uh, the, the Doof Media Network at $10 or above, you get access to a special monthly Q&A stream, which actually the next one of these is happening uh, tomorrow in less than 24 hours from when this podcast is released at uh, Tuesday, 1.30pm in Australian Eastern Daylight Time, which I think is useful for maybe 5% of our listeners. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's 9.30pm Central Time on Monday mm. for for the American audience, which, you know... For everyone, for most of the listeners, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, if you're listening to this right now, you still have time, hopefully. Uh, you should back the Patreon and you can get access to a special Q&A stream where you can ask questions of the... Uh, of the main doof crew and yeah ask them anything and they have to legally they have to answer it <laughs> yeah it's 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 a whole packed thing um <laughs> and, and uh while we're talking about patreon don't forget to stop by wabo's patreon which is patreon.com slash wabo because he writes all these stories yep um yeah and uh, while we're talking about the future of this podcast we should also mention that the future of this podcast is that our next episode 4.10 will come out on the 29th of march on a friday so uh we'll see you all then See ya.